And thank you for letting us be part of this process. Um, we plan to blog on our Green NBA site about Venetia because you guys are very special and we are very proud of being part of this process. Constance, I think you are our first, we won't call you our first victim. victim yeah. <laughs> I'm presenting for the Community Sustainability Commission and our action plan. Can everybody see? Am I standing right in the way? Um, was about positive messaging. And I'll preface it by saying that today I sat in uh, interviews with our potential climate action plan coordinators and um, virtually to every, of the, every one of the five presenters said Benicia is absolutely unique and leading the way um, in the kinds of things that, that we as a city and as a commission are doing in order to promote sustainability. Of course, they were applying for a job. They would want to say nice things. <laughs> Okay, so the plan is positive messaging. Our time frame is 2012 to 2013. Our mission as a commission is to educate, advocate, and provide oversight for integrated solutions seeking a sustainable <coughs> equilibrium for economic, ecological, and social health and well-being. I always like to say amen, but we don't have that. And the vision is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in accordance with the Climate Action Plan, provi provide sound oversight for the Valero Good Neighbor Steering Committee, settlement agreement funds, and engage the community in sustainability efforts. And the Action Plan um, is to demonstrate the Community Sustainability Commission's efforts to work for the benefit of the entire community. Our SWAT, now I hope you can appreciate the, the graphics there. We have strength in the hands, and we have weakness in the broken link. We have opportunity, and we have threats, of course, there as a bomb. So, I might use those. You're welcome. They're all on Google. So, um, under our strengths, we have a committed commission members, uh, support by the mayor, other city commissioners, many community members, our a presence. Mayor, right? Pardon? Our new mayor. Our new mayor, our, our re elected mayor. We have a presence in the local paper, a series of successful education programs. Yay! Um, our opportunities, let's say our weaknesses, complex working relationship with city management, which is getting better, loss of energy due to meeting schedules that we meet infrequently, uh, extensive nature of the commission scope. I mean, sustainability is economic, <coughs> environmental, and social. It's almost like shampooing the dog. Where do you, do, do you start? And we overlap with so many things. Um, limited knowledge of the entire scope of sustainability. Many of us on the commission and in the community are new to the concept of sustainability and the millions of laws and, and things that go on uh, from a local, regional, national resource and best practice to scientific knowledge that we need and lack of time. That's, and then our opportunities, we have an interested community, access to knowledgeable people and, and resources, and we have funding, we have funding, big thing, which is also um, a weakness because it's considered funding where nobody else has funding is considered political and, and so we have to really mitigate um, any ill feelings. And then our uh, threats, local, national, political nature of sustainability and climate change, Natural disasters, we could have a big earthquake and that could wipe out efforts, and the poor economy, which could also be turned, many times threats can also be turned into opportunities. I'm going to point it and we'll see if it happens. Ah. So here's the grid, tiny type. Get your, your binoculars out. Um, as an instructor, I would never allow this in a presentation, but so our objectives is um, create alliances with more community groups and organizations as one of our major objectives. And a strategy is to be present and literally attend the uh, Economic Development Board meetings, the Arts and Culture Commission, the General Plan, or, or the Planning Commission, um, Green Business, if we can somewhere partner more with, with you, um, uh, Michael. Um, Benicia High School has the Echo 2 Academy and a SAGE group. Um, they're there, we know about it, we just haven't had a lot of outreach at this point. The Historic Preservation Committee, our churches, schools, the American Women, uh, Un American Association of University Women's, the Seroptimist, League of Women Voters, BIPA, a lot, Allied Waste, which we're having great partnership now. So make sure that we're, we're present uh, and seeking opportunities there. 
And then I won't go into all the details, but we'll assign commissioners to attend the meetings, we'll partner where possible, we'll work with uh, Mary Farmer, Robert Semple, Benicia Middle Schools, et cetera, for maybe green science fairs. Um, and we'll have to have commissioners and the commission, um, our work group one, work with the academy students, and we start in January to move through. And um, we look forward to uh, how much we'll have to take a look at how much our funding is allowed and the grant process, but success me measurement would be attendance at meetings and reports to the CSC, which is not a, a measurement I would consider an important one, but one that does indicate collaborative events that we have, number of green science projects, et cetera. And we could do other things like grant awards for green science fairs, um, for green businesses that are stepping forward and success that we have there, and we can grant awards, which is part of our climate action plan. And then we can um, partner to uh, set up a, a <coughs> clean tech expo with uh, businesses and firms uh, within uh, the community. And we can tie that into something, maybe just transform our Earth Day into something that really um, goes a little bit deeper and extends a little bit further. So a lot of detail there. Um, and I think that's the end of it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to reiterate what Constance said earlier and say thank you to Laura Lee, Nancy, and indeed the entire Green MBA program at Dominican University for making this series possible. I've really enjoyed it and I've learned a lot. So I knew very little about action planning prior to this series. Just a quick background on my presentation this evening. Last week, I, became, I was appointed co-chair of the communications subcommittee of the Benicia State Park Stakeholders Committee. And I've been working to put together an action plan for that subcommittee with my co-chair, whom many of you, I would imagine, know, Bonnie Silveria. So we're still in the very uh, preliminary stages, if you will, of our, present, of our action plan. However, I wanted to go over one primary objective that I put together um, also on Sunday night, as Constance said, and I'll be discussing with Bonnie uh, tomorrow. So the primary objective really is to increase public awareness of and support for the Benicia State Park Stakeholders Committee. Read, keep the Capitol open and accessible to the public. So that is our primary objective. Um, I devised several strategies. Uh, firstly, develop and implement a marketing campaign with two tactics. Firstly, regular press releases and articles in local publications. So essentially keeping uh, the issue of the state capital and state recreation area, the parks closure, in the public eye. Uh, second tactic, make use of web resources. We have now a website, which Gene Doherty, who also, I would imagine many of you know, has put together www.protectbeniciastateparks.com and a Facebook page, www.facebook.com dash beniciastateparks. So you know, we need to make use of those resources, you know, to the, in the most, uh, in a manner that's most efficacious, if you will. Um, as for the executors, Okay, as for you know, the who, the executors, I've termed them. Uh, firstly, with regard to the articles, um, myself, Bonnie, or someone from the communication subgroup would be the one writing these articles and sending them to the, to the uh, various publications. As for the second tactic, the, the website and Facebook page, uh, we would need the web uh, the site overseer, who is presently Gene, but that may change, he would be the one responsible for that. As for the timeline, uh, we're in progress presently. Uh, you know, we'll be looking for results as soon as possible with this. Um, 
I'll address cost later after I touch upon our second strategy, which was facilitate interaction between the committee and the public. Um, tactics would be encourage outside attendance of committee functions and Benicia State Parks Association functions. Um, we have a variety of, of different functions, which I won't go into now, as I wrote three minutes there, which may There's not be no quite time. accurate. Keep okay, <laughs> excellent. Um, second tactic, attend outside functions. So, um, Chamber of Commerce, perhaps, uh, various other meetings, um, city council meetings, for example. Um, again, the executors of both of these tactics would be someone from the communications subgroup. Um, again, timeline is in progress immediately. And as for the cost for all of these tactics, uh, the pecuniary cost or the monetary cost is relatively minimal, perhaps even zero. Um, the time, the temporal cost is considerably greater. This takes a lot of time to put this together. So, um, Thank you for hearing me, and I just would like to conclude by saying I've enjoyed meeting all of you, and I look forward to further interaction down the line. Thank you. So I am uh, the board member of the Benicia Community Gardens, and I will be talking about the project because we're in the process of the strategic planning for the next five years, and it's a very big in scope and com rather complex undertaking. So I'll take you through where we are now and where would we like to go and just talk about a couple projects that are very different, just to give you a feel for where we are all heading. So as of now, the current mission of the Benicia Community Gardens is encourage and enable actual establishing gardens to grow healthy food and uh, provide fellowship, beauty, and discovery. Very simple, to the core description of what we do. And uh, there are two gardens. One is the, that's the original one, which was established in 1999. It's next to the Presbyterian Church which uh, was established by the late Dr. Swenson. So we refer to it as Dr. Swenson Garden. And then the newer one, uh, the, the famous first street oven garden, that went on in 2010. <coughs> so that's the current picture. And we have, um, in 2003, company got incorporated as a nonprofit. Currently, um, it was funded through a few small grants and with very low operating budget a year. And we have another source of revenue. We do ask for water donation towards the water bill, but we do not charge any annual fee from the gardeners. We have about 40 gardeners and seven people on wait list. So that's where we are now. Wow. For both gardens, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when we start talking about the future, you know, the organization reached the point when uh, it's ready to take next step. So it's, we start asking, what are we all about? And it turned out we're all <laughs> about food. And we had numerous discussions and brainstorming. And that's where we are. That's <laughs> one of our, it was, um, we had to define for ourselves, if we are talking about something huge as food, where would be our area of influence? Where we could really make a difference as a small nonprofit in Benicia? So we began looking at what is it, a food? And it turned out that <coughs> as of now, we are in this huge hollow of the industrial agriculture. And we couldn't find out anything good about this. So it's, <laughs> it's a totally unsustainable system that destroys the soil, poisons air and water. Plus, there is this big factor is California is on the front line of the globalization of food. So once you turn food, which is essential nutri nutrition for humans, into commodity for the speculation, a lot of very interesting things start happening. One of them, for example, is the, um, the mass production, processing, and distribution. So we're moving million of tons of food from California, actually to be exact, about 
67 million tons are coming into California annually, and about 37 million tons of food going out. And 94% of it is going by trucks. So here's the food miles we're talking about, the air pollution, the CO2 gas emission. It just, we're just scratching the surface of the damage that is done. Uh, the, you know, the, not <coughs> the animals' welfare is involved. If you look at fishery, um, you know, the collapse of species in the ocean, the overfishing, and it's all part of globalization because overfishing is done by countries that are not fishing for their own needs, they're fishing for export. So all of it is converging in this complex of industrial agriculture. So when we looked at this monster, we said, well, no, there's not much we could do about this, other than uh, in the very tip of this, we could increase awareness. And what was the most shocking for us about this system is that with all this food in and out, only 40% of California needs is actually satisfied through California food. The rest were ex important. So there is n we're not really self-reliant on food in this very state, in this very town. So our only hope in the big scale would be the local food. That's why we're talking about local small farms because by definition the smaller scale would be more sustainable. They have to diversify the, the crop, it's not monoculture. There is more sustainable land management practices. Plus the, there is this issue of close connection in the big system. You really, it's an absent owner. You don't know whom you're dealing with. Here it's more human. And then you know we also look <coughs> in the smaller other food um, players would be restaurants. It's really sad that in Benicia there is not a single restaurant which would say locally grown produce. You know, you go to San Francisco and you know exactly which farm their salad came from. Benicia, none. Um, there are no small processes, no small distributors. And then if you look at the legal environment, is it punitive or is it promoting food? And just in one example, you know, you cannot keep bees in, in, in Benicia, right? Legally. There is still a ban, yes, a beekeeping. So that's what we're talking about local. <coughs> <coughs> so in, here we said, okay, uh, what could we do here? We could provide support. We could build the structures to provide support for these local farmers and local businesses that are actually doing the right thing. So then we were looking at the family and local community area. Here is where we're dealing with food and income problem because access to food is a big issue in this community, and um, there is also resources used. You know, and I'm not going through all of it, but um, you know, when th there is this cheap calorie issue that people could not afford healthy food, that at the same time we are wasting 40% of the food in this very community. And you would think of Benicia as a very, you know, rather well-off town, yet St. Paul, you know, for their weekly meal, they feed up to 100 people every Wednesday. So that's the scale of problem in Benicia with food. Uh, and then, you know, of course, on the very and here we're saying, okay, here we could probably influence more. Here's the resource use, here's the land use, and here's the redistribution of access. Because on one side you have access of food that is wasted, on the other side you have hungry people right here. So that's why we could influence. That's how we, you know, doing the areas of influence. And the last one is a very human dip here that whole lost relationship with food and nature in general, so we don't understand where it's coming from. And that's why we were talking about education support um, for that conversation in the community about what food is and what it is not. And our uh, overall conclusion was that um, the food is largely overlooked. In the climate action plan, there is no chapter dedicated to food. You know, if you think about the sustainable community, the food, you, you know, you could argue you could live without private cars, but you cannot live without food. Or when we were doing the conversation maps, food did not come up. It was very, you know, it, it just, yes, yeah, I put them, but. <laughs> no, but it's, it, it's really, we come to it over and over again. It's so obvious that we take it for granted and that there is no security. We don't think about this. So, what started emerging from all this conversation is that 
it's not a final new mission, but it's a new components of a mission. That we're preparing ourselves to take the leadership role in the um, providing local food security. That uh, we would influence the supply, the quality, quantity of supply of food from sustainable sources. That we would address the access to healthy food and um, help to redistribute the access. We're talking about wise use of resources in providing for food. <coughs> and the last one, creating structures of action. Because what we are finding, every time I'm addressing a group, I pr almost guarantee someone would raise a hand and say, I have a project, I have nowhere to go. So what people need is structures where they could bring the projects in. You know, if we just leave the action plan, uh, the climate action plan, the way it's now, without any structures, and it will stay on paper. Yep. So then, you know, after all of this, we <laughs> nailed down 25 in the beginning, and now there are 27 projects, and we're not going to, to do them all at once, and we're not going to, you know, address them now. But again, you know, some projects were brought to us by people who've heard it, and we're just in the beginning of communicating this. Then I said, okay, what would we do? Uh, and we went for low-hanging fruit. We needed something that is a key, has a key person in place already that doesn't require initial funding and that would have either synergies with other projects on the list or would have a potential <coughs> for social enter enterprise because for us it's very important. It will be funded through grants in the beginning, but we cannot be relying on solely on the grants. So for our five-year plan, the social enterprise would definitely be a factor because we would like to finance this mostly ourselves. So after this, we, these are the projects that are now on the table for us. And I'm going to just take you through three of them because they're very different. So the first one is the community-supported agriculture, which is now nearing the completion of the implementation stage. So what we envision is, okay, we need one place in Benicia where local farms, processors, producers could deliver food. It becomes the community-supported agriculture central. Then why are we doing it? Precisely to address that support for local farms, health and well-being of local people is right there, and education for the community. So those are three areas that are affected through this project. Those were our criteria for choosing the um, farms, the, the processors. So they, they have to be local. They have to be either organic or sustainable because there is, you know, when you get to meat and seafood, organic makes no sense, but sustainable will make sense. They should be near, nearly year-round. And then what was very important for us, they need to be authentic because we are finding a lot of, well, some dealers on the market that you would think they are farm, they are not. Farm fresh to you, have you seen those pickups? Mm -hmm. They don't actually grow food, they're consolidating food. You get mango and bananas through that box. So we were looking for someone uh, who signed the pledge of authenticity, guaranteeing they've raised this very food in this very local farm. Uh, and then um, the way it's done, you, it's a direct relationship between farm and subscribers. So our role is to establish the infrastructure and promote it in the local community. S the implementation is going to take four stages. We started with the fresh produce and uh, <coughs> fruits and vegetables. The next one would be proteins, beginning with eggs and chicken. That's an easy one to locate. And then later, seafood and meat. Then fat, you know, olive oil for us locally. And then sweets would be honey. And we hope by then we would have uh, that ban on the beekeeping <laughs> lifted so we could actually give people place to bring their honey because we know there are a lot of beekeepers in Benicia but they are undercover <laughs> yeah but yeah we all know them and then once it's implemented the second stage would be ongoing maintenance and measuring the success so here you know once you have a site this status check with the host is very important because people are coming and going for their food we need to address any issues immediately then there are a number of subscribers, you know, that will tell us the success, part of the story of success of this program. And then the satisfaction rating uh, once a year, we would love to have a little questionnaire about the quality of produce and logistics, how easy is it and you know, how. That's how the action plan looked like. 
So we ident and it's actually changed as of today. But our first candidate was the Presbyterian Church because they were very interested to host the centralized location. And they had to run it by their board mm -hmm. and they promised us a decision by the end of this week. Well, I got it today and it's a go. <laughs> yep, and then, yes, the farm was identified. Uh, it's a terra firma farm and I have small um, business cards if you guys would like to pick it up and check them out. You could start signing up for the produce uh, for that first stage. Um, so we, we've reached the written agreement with them by that day. That was done. We were doing quiet promotions because we didn't know if that's a go or not. So now that it's a go, we could do a full um, promotion. And um, our spokesperson is here. <laughs> the chair of the board is actually here. I should have introduced you, by the way. The chair of BCG board, Marilyn Bardet is there, and Larry Lamaro. 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 The board member is also here. Uh, so that's a local press. What we need to do here is uh, 15 members signed up is enough for them to start delivering. Okay. Yeah. And then this is not important anymore, plan B, in case that this fails. Uh, and then the first delivery we hope to start at January 15 from the farm. So that's done. Question. Yes, go ahead. Did you, did you do any surveying as far as you know, the number of 15, just see what the interest would be outside of the, the members within the group by chance, out of curiosity? We haven't done promotion yet. We know there is interest. Okay. We, we hope that 15 is not a big number for Benicia okay. to start. Mm -hmm. okay. Go ahead. That new store that opened up to Rocco's was that says they're fresh. Are they local grown or no? I don't know. Are they saying that? Pardon? Do they say that? They say it's organic. They're advertising as organic, aren't they? Okay, but not local. I, I bought four avocados the other day, which were very nice, but they came from Chile. Okay. I just wanted to know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. So the second project is, uh, we call it Seeds of Hope. It's, an, it's a third community garden in Benicia, but it's going to be very different this time. We are talking about the low income community and that's why we're gonna, why we're doing it? Because that's where the food and income problem interfere there. And there is still health and well-being of these people. There is education involved and the land use. Because you know, those communities are sitting on a very nice plot of land that has a very pathetic landscape and, and a lot of water going in it. So the idea is to start small by install in small garden <laughs> plots for families that are interested, help them install it and take care of it. And then it's a baby step and each small plot is a victory and it's each new family would be a victory. What will come with that, because that an education part is casual talks, we're not going to lecture them on the benefit of the fresh grown food, but we need a conversation with this particular population we're talking about Saturday programs for their kids. Uh, and this is came from our own gardeners who said, we wasted so much food in our gardens. We had such an abundance this fall, we couldn't harvest, we couldn't eat it. So one of our members said, I will harvest it and I will bring to that community so they could start eating before their garden is growing. Uh, so he's very different. Um, do I have to go through all of it now? Okay, because here, you know, there are four people involved. It's a key team, and each of them is implementing um, a small piece of it. Education, community involvement, outreach, and so on. And the last project, which is in a total, you know, um, beginning stage, that's why I wanted to bring that one, is um, we call it Benicia Sustainable Backyard, and the idea is why don't we pick up a few very different backyards in Benicia. Hillside, downtown, small lot, big lot, you know, and build showcases, right? Help these people, these uh, homeowners, turn it into sustainable backyard. And sustainable backyard are very well defined now, so we know what we're talking about. We would document the process so that people could follow, and then the condition would be it will be open to public, maybe once a month, how we do the historic you know, um, location, right? Tours, we could do sustainable backyard tours. 
Uh, why are we doing it? Again, there are skills and knowledge here. There is a land use issue and other resources like water, you know, and you see all this grass. There is health and well-being. And here again, we're addressing that whole structure that's missing. There are a couple projects in the climate action plan that we thought would be perfect trial ground where we could test the policies, we could, you know, find the providers. Mm -hmm give the resources to people, something tangible. You could come and see and find the business card of who did it, you know, how it was done, how much it cost. Uh, and what we realized, <laughs> that we don't have the skills and, and expertise to do this. And probably nobody does. So the solution here would be create an advisory board and have people from different interested parties, from different groups in community come together and try to define the scope, how it's going to look like. So that's a potential list. We don't have all of them here yet, but the plan would be by the end of January, have key people in place for the advisory board and start a conversation, and the rest will be determined by the advisory board. That's it. Um. Before I get to that, I want, what I wanted to say about the, pro, the about the only thing really, I'll go back to the project a little bit at the end. But um, I do really think some of the projects, including this one, is designed to work with a whole lot of other s segments of the community. The art community is separated from the history community, is separated from this community, is separated from that community, and so forth. So we need a lot of that mending in town. And one of the reasons for doing this project that we're interested in. Um, is because I think, and, I'll, and you'll see why I think if you don't know already, um, I think it actually literally builds bridges and gives people an opportunity to travel between a lot of different projects that are out there, like the community gardens, if they could, if they were open for tours, there may be ways in which we could get folks to be able to kind of travel around in little golf carts, which is what this is about actually, um, and be able to visit some of these sites while they're here playing as tourists. So. Anyway, if you look at the front page on it, if you have a copy of this, there's four steps that I'm trying to do. I want to prepare the grant application for a low-speed vehicle golf cart project. And what the way that we envision it would be, there might be four or five of these carts that would be able to be running around downtown on the flatlands during the summer months or the times when the tourists and visitors might be most visible. And in fact, hire some young people to uh, drive those carts around, paying them a minimum wage and stuff, and using them as essentially tour, gu tour uh, guides for to help get people around in, in both to history, to art, and other things like that. So we want to put an application together for that. What I would like to do is receive some feedback from Greenies, that would be you folks, and other community members who are having, who have an interest in putting an application together to get it funded to try a new kind of a project. So that's the second of, you know, go ahead. Is it okay to ask a question now? Why not? I'm just wondering whether you would be, um, or your committee or whoever would be applying as a, as a new business or uh, as a, under the aegis of a nonprofit, or how would you manage that? Well, it's one of the issues of clarification because the, lo the rules say that you can use a variety of forms um, and I was actually told that the biggest thing was to make sure you kind of protect the bank account so you can show the movie with, uh, that the money was spent properly. So it might be that our project was nothing more than a collection of interested po per, uh, persons or organizations representing different sectors who came together and as functioning effectively as a governing board oversaw the money as well as the project. But it also might be put within a 501c3 or some other entity of that nature, or it might go through another, another business or something. I, I would suggest a collaborative approach, and maybe the Main Street and other groups in town that would be interested because of what you have stated is your interest in group making bridges between areas of town. Um, to do with as you know, there's politics too involved in it, and who yeah. some people don't like certain groups, and I, some I people won't even attend those group one. meetings. <laughs> So part of, that was part of the reason for not answering the question more directly, but also to say that it might be the project might be worth doing it a slightly different way in order to, as long as it's allowable to do it that way. So, so okay. So the second anyway. So I want the the action plan is to prepare the grant application package. 
Second one is to get feedback and advice from folks like you and others. Um, the third item is to, through that process, is to develop what would effectively be a team of people interested in the project from various perspectives. We're not going into this all designed and ready to go. We're kind of creating it enough to put it into the application package and we would really like to, I would really like to grow the organization sustainably <laughs> by going through the process of figuring out how to get to the end result. I've had the pleasure of my life to work on a number of initiatives both internationally, nationally, and locally. Uh, and most of them start as pre-designed organizations and then go through the hell of trying to figure out how to get out of those problems in order to make the project worse. And nine out of ten times the project fails, in my opinion, because of something that already exists in the organizational structure. I do a lot of nonprofit stuff and I tell people this a lot when they actually pay me to do advice on nonprofit stuff is be careful with this. This becomes a very big issue for you and it causes organizations a whole lot of problems. So I would rather grow an organization into a project that I think fits and part of this action plan is going through that step to do it. And then once those pieces are together, the application, the ideas as to how to make it, work, a group of people ready to move forward with it. We have the entity needed to go to the Sustainability Commission and tell them, we dare you to turn down this request because we need this money because it's going to do an awful lot of things. The thing that I want to mention on that I think it's going to do that's really valuable is in fact building some bridges between sectors. Uh, Richard is is working with a golf car, they call it on their cart, but on their business car, golf car project, but it's a golf electric vehicles, uh, uh, what is it, LSVs are low speed vehicles, low speed vehicles <laughs> which are basically golf carts, electric ones that are sold right here in Benicia, modified right here in Benicia. So part of the origin, the idea behind this project was to go to them in the industrial park, say we want to work with you on First Street, we want to bring in commercial centers who might be viable. We want to bring in artistic communities who have uh, studios that never get visitors to them. We want to bring in historic parts of town that never get seen by anybody. And since we don't have streams of people in the tourist campaign or in our tour for tourism, it would be perfectly viable in most days to have these little vehicles riding around town that people could hop on and hop off as they wish to do so. And But if they're not required to follow a route during a busy day, if it's a Saturday or something like they might be following a route, they would be able to go to different sites. The sites would not be only, totally open for them, but it would be based on the idea that the, the driver of the vehicle and everybody knows some good places to go, knows what's safe, how to get there, alerts the supervisor where they're going, various things of that nature. So I just wanted to say though, the big part about it is the idea that it can build some bridges between everything including uh, the industrial park back to First Street and uh, some of the biking projects that are coming up. I mean, it's a perfect example to me that one of the juncture points for this project would be the end of First Street, which is on the Bay Trail. So you could, in theory, ride your bike. And if you didn't want, if your butt was sore by the time you got to Benicia, because you rode all the way around the Bay, you could get off of it and get on an electric vehicle, ride around to all the stuff get off at Coda and watch an electric vehicle be made, come back down and do something else electric downtown and get back on your bike with your sore butt and go home. Um, that's a pretty good thing actually and that's the kind of thing that could be marketed well as Benicia being a hub of something different than any other communities. I see you back there, I'm not ignoring you so go ahead. As we did Waterhouse a year ago, we still have all our inspections and I found out some really big things that could have saved me a lot of money. Unfortunately, I got to spend a lot of money. One is I have to replace my water heater. And I'm, I've been looking in research and there's a, a GE electric water pump that's supposed to be really good on power. But what I found really neat about it is you can hook a solar panel to it and not a big solar panel like the solar panels I use on my sailboat. And they say that it runs off a 12 volt battery. So you can keep a 12 volt battery that's hooked to a solar panel and won't run your water heater. Because in reality, how often do you run your water just after you just took a shower and everything? So it's not, so that, I found that really cool. I said one to two years because I'm gonna wait for the other one to die. 
which I think is happening any moment because it's a 1991 water heater. <laughs> and I didn't believe it when I read the inspection. I had to call around it today. And it's a 1991 water heater. So, and I did this in two parts. I broke it up, same little water. And this is just a snapshot because my spreadsheet's so much bigger than this. I could go on. I didn't. Uh, then I wanted to do uh, save rainwater for our garden. We have one raised garden, and next year we want to have another one. And we want to figure out how to make a greenhouse so we can grow food all year round. Uh, I went online because originally my wife was like, "You got to." I use these old plastic barrels right now. She hates them. She thinks they're so ugly. So I went online looking at wine barrels and had about a heart attack when I found out how much they cost. But then I came across this tough serve. Um, they're 50 gallon. Uh, recyclable material made uh, water thing but the other thing I found cool with them is they have an airtight seal for the pump so when you get done with the water and it's full and you want to pump it into another barrel or move barrels around it's airtight so therefore it does, the pump doesn't have to work as high and they also come with an electric pump that goes off of a battery again I can use my little I own a sailboat so I use the little solar panels and I um, uh, recharge my batteries all the time so I found that was really cool. And then, uh, oh yeah, then changed the toilet in the master bathroom. We have a, um, we have a water save so toilet in our uh, main hallway, I guess, guest bathroom. And so I decided to look online because I really liked the way this thing worked. It flush, basically it uses one gallon of water that's equal to like five gallons when the power goes through. And so I went online and started looking for those and I was almost, I was shocked. You can buy the toilet with the pump and everything for under $200 um, if you don't want to get too fancy with your toilets. Um, if you want to get fancy, they go up to 500 but I was pretty amazed with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a guy, man. My comfort level is not nearly as... <laughs> and I used to sell the on-site diesel fields, so I know what the blue portage on, so if I can go... <laughs> so, um, then I went down to power, and uh, I found this interesting, because PG&E, well, they have a survey that you can do online, but they don't come to people's homes anymore. They only go to businesses, which I found really interesting. They want you to do the one online. I did it today, and it pretty much told me everything I already know. It's not the same as someone walking in and checking out where you're losing heat. So I started looking, because they had a solar program in there, and I made a few phone calls. Almost every solar company is more than happy to come out and do an energy free audit for you and show everything. Solar City did it. Um, forget the other one I called. In fact, they were jumping through hoops when I even said, well, I wouldn't mind because they want to come out and try to sell you. So I found that interesting. And then um, I have to uh, get a new house heater because looking in my survey, my house heater is from 1974. And I'm shocked it's still running. <laughs> so I've been looking for different heating systems, and that's where it goes different. You can't see on my grid because I found a whole bunch. There's uh, one that runs off of solar panels, not big solar panels, that you can run just for the heater. And it's pipes that you put underneath your floorboards and then put insulation underneath them. And you can do it yourself for about $2,000 to $3,000, depending on your house, if you got the right layout. Mine is I do because I have a crawl space underneath and you just hook it up with brackets underneath the, the wood and you put insulation. Or you can pay them to do it and it ranges anywhere from four to 5,000. So uh, that was pretty neat. But then I also figured out a plan in case my heater dies like this winter and we don't have three or $4,000. If they got these infrared heaters that are really supposed to save power and I have friends that use them back in Michigan and they quit using their gas heater because these things are so good on energy just using electric power. So that's my backup because that's only 190. And that's just a snapshot, so that's what my plans are. And I had, you know, how much it costs I range. Uh, pretty much everything on this is done by me. Except I think I might have them do the heater if I do the heating system underneath it for the fact that you're dealing with electricity, a whole bunch of other, and they're bonded. I'm not. <laughs> so if they burn down my house, I can get something. So that's it. <laughs> yeah. 
home yeah. and equipment. My home's in the 50s. Okay, how, in one of the reports, did they give you any asbestos? They did not find any. Not, not any? Not any. Okay. But it had all brand new insulation up in the, in the attic. Right, and my guy checked it and everything, and someone even, which we can tell in the summertime, our house stays very cool, they even insulated the walls. So our house, in that regard, someone did go take the time through and probably, cleaned it all out. yeah, probably cleaned it all out. But yeah, it's a 50s home. I had a friend who had that floor stuff put in. Uh-huh. Yeah, I wasn't going to do it through electric power. I was going to do it through solar power. They have a panel that they sell with it that's uh, basically um, yeah. an 8 by 10 panel that would be just dedicated to it. And you can put it on your roof or you can put it on your backyard. In so other words, it's not a panel that you would have to have a lot more panel to do power for your own whole house. Mm -hmm. This is just a panel that they have that specifically runs a line that you can do just for that now. And you can put it in your backyard, like you, well, you helped us move. We have a really big backyard, so I can put a panel somewhere out, and it's also included. People can't see it, and I'm probably breaking every kind of rule there is, but I feel with the big fence, my backyard's okay. When I first started this class, I was already taking a lot of green classes. Um, I've done a Bay Friendly training, I've done, I'm now in. EPA certified water auditor as well as irrigation designer and I have a whole lot of green metals hanging on the wall. So um, when I came in here kind of what my focus was was to try to continue being able to communicate the fact that I have all those green metals on the wall to, to clientele. Um, and I just became qualified to do the irrigation audits, and that's something that I wanted to add to my business. So really what I'm kind of doing is thinking about what my business plan is going to be when I write it in January, which is the time of year when landscape designers get to write anything. Um, I'm the owner of Simply Perfect Gardens. My name's Allison Fleck, just in case anybody wants to know. Um, so what we did in class, I thought at first, okay, so my objective would be to offer irrigation audits, but in fact, that's not true. Um, my objective is to communicate to the public in all of my forms of communication that I am eloquent in all things green and um, able to help them save money and resources in creating not only a livable but a comfortable space for their home where we can mix food with, with other things, we can save as much water, water as they want, we can keep water on site, anything green. So offering the irrigation audit is one of the big ticket items truly because it's an EPA thing. Um, environment, uh, a protection agency. It's big, big ticket. So I'm going to redo all of my communications um, and I'm going to put my Bay Friendly stamp and mention this class and um, put the EPA, all the stickers all over everything and make sure that it's all really clear. Um, but Beyond that, because of this class, I realized that um, there is the possibility of putting together a grant to uh, try to get money from the Sustainability Commission. And so that is something that I'll probably work on. The phone stops ringing on Thanksgiving Day for me. And it doesn't ring again usually until February 14th. If you ever need a landscape design done, keep that in mind. So <laughs> after Thanksgiving is when I'll start consolidating the information that I need. And I'm going to have a WACO um, 
Is that what it is? It's the, uh, there is an audit that's available through the city of Phoenicia that will come in. Watsa. And they'll come in and they'll test your whole house. So I'm going to have that done as a good first step so that I can make sure that what I offer is a really good fit for the Watsa test. Um, also, I'll look at how they do um, the checklists. Uh, Contra Costa Water District offers pretty much what I want to offer, so I'll also look at how they do their checklists and take it from there. Um, and I think that's it. That's all I thought, with all that stuff written down. So any questions? So I'm going to ask you to shift gears. My name is B. Reynolds, and I'm, I'm going to very briefly um, introduce the topic. It's, it's, so, it's so singular. Um, as, as I heard everyone's projects and the titles on the, on, the, on the projects to come, I'm thinking, my goodness, my focus is very, very narrow and very singular. Um, I was hired approximately a year and a half ago by this company. Uh, I'm a consultant. I'm an uh, industrial hygienist, health and safety consultant. And so what I do is I go in, I do um, gap analysis according to regulatory requirements on, on health and safety, industrial hygiene, environmental factors, you know, et cetera. And I put together the information and come up with a plan. And um, Okay. Um, when I was listening to everybody with their sustainability, it was all about products and um, practices. And to me, it's more than just products and practices. It's about the, you know, the whole person. And when you build a sustainable building, it's supposed to be a healthy building to be in. When you're doing sustainable landscaping, you're feeding people with it. So um, what I was noticing is that when you hear people talk on the news, it's about kids are isolated, they're playing with the iPads, they're playing video games. And <clears throat> it isn't just kids, it's adults. We've become very much attached to our cell phones and our emails. And sometimes I have several friends that I don't see much anymore because they think Facebook is good enough. So what I was going to say is that um, when you look at a problem, to get people to buy into sustainability, buy into green, you have to get them to buy into their community. So if isolation is the problem, volunteering is the answer. Um, volunteering helps, uh, I'm going to read this off, sorry. <laughs> it helps the volunteer feel more important. If you have somebody that has low self-esteem, if they help somebody walk a dog, or if they help read a book to a child, they feel better about themselves because they know they did something. Um, it helps the community because when we're working together, we start paying attention to other people. Um, you were talking about the Food Commission. You're now growing to where you're seeing how people are not getting their food, but there are people that have it. So when you work together, that's what you see. Um, and it also helps the people in need. When you're down and out, when you... Um, I have a friend in mine had always volunteered, but had children that were very sick, wasn't even able to work. And so here they were, the same people that she had volunteered with when she was younger, they came out with food and gifts and everything for Christmas for her. She got to see how it all worked out. It was hard for her because, like I said, that was what she had done, but she was able to see where it came out. Um, I tried to change that to a different color. Uh, I, I've taken 23 years to get my bachelor degree. One of the classes I took was in history, and I wanted to take a history class that meant something. So I took a history class that used a book that incorporated indigenous people's mindsets. It incorporated lots of things. And the end project, we had to make a website that did something similar. So when I was looking around and um, looking for something inspirational, I came across an obituary. And it was about perpetuating Katie's memory. And Katie was a former slave. She, um, she worked with 
families and she was incorporated into the families. They had her doing baking and that's actually how she got out of slavery. But they also had her teaching the children but they wouldn't let her learn. And so here she was in a um, minister's house helping the kids learn their Bible. And she had done it for so many years she actually ended up memorizing the Bible. So um, what happened when she became a free person, she went up to New York. And she looked around, and the only place she could afford was in the tenements. And as she was there walking from her house to service, she was watch, watching the children play in the street, because that was the only day they had off from the factories. These kids were working in factories. And she just looked, and she figured, this isn't right. And she went and talked to the pastor, and the pastor said, well, I can lend you some Bibles. So she started in her home with these Bibles and these kids, and she would have them pick a, a part to read. And she couldn't read it with them, but she knew it by heart. Well, at some point, <laughs> the pastor pulled her in, and that was the beginning of Sunday schools. Um, and, but what it also showed me was that she was illiterate. The only reason why I knew her story was because somebody else wrote about it. That whole lesson could have been lost. So my action is I want to get a way to get people to volunteer. So I have two um, objectives. First one is to launch my nonprofit. I have the website. I have all these ideas. I have a whole page right here on the website that um, tells people to get involved in their community. And it starts off with, you can fight literacy, and it has a web, national website. Um, you can fight domestic violence. Uh, you can also join Volunteers of America. So it was a very beginning thing. Um, but it needs more than that, because that's not, that this stagnant website's not gonna inspire anybody. So I need to build the nonprofit. The next part, is I need to get people to want to volunteer. And what I've learned is if somebody tells a story, somebody likes to listen. If somebody likes to talk, they like to tell a story. And so that's why I started building in um, the, the Perpetuate the Memory of Katie, was that if we tell our stories, if we write them down, they'll always be there. People will, will always know that. It won't, there won't be a chance of something being lost. But um, there's other buy-ins that have to happen. People have to be willing to tell their story. And people have to be willing to see that there's a benefit to that. So when I did my SWAT, I realized people do want to help. I've never met a person that woke up in the morning and says, I want to blow up the world. Because even the people that really want to do that, when they wake up in the morning, they want to go brush their teeth first or something. So people want to do something other than hurt people, I think. And people want to be recognized. They may not want to stand up in front. They may not want to have somebody give them an award because that may be embarrassing. But they want to have somebody come up and say, hey, you know, it was really nice what you did today. It really made my, de my day a little brighter. The weaknesses are is that we're inundated. The truth is, is we are in a world that is very impersonal. We are on computers. We, we are doing all these things. So it's very hard to feel like you have a little bit of free time. And for the most part, people want things handed to them. Um, unless it's something you have a passion about, you really don't want to go too far out of your way to find something. You know, if you're passionate about it, you will find it. You will dig it up. But if it's something that you just have a passing interest in, unless it's in front of you, it's not going to go very far. Um, the opportunities. Um, schools are requiring children to volunteer. There are works that are giving their people paid time to volunteer. And there are societies that are trying to do the bridging together. And sometimes it's easier to bridge when you're through a third party than it is to try and go head to head and have your ideologies mash up. And, um, but the thing is, is I know that there are other places to go. I, I put a couple of them on that website. So I need it to be different. And um, I, need it to know, I needed it to be something that people could trust. So what, what I need to do <laughs> is I need to take the website and make it dynamic. 
I need to make it live. It needs to be something that somebody can search. They can put, feel like they've put things in, but they're not on the, on they're not on the line. Their name is right there saying, yeah, I walk, I walk my neighbor's dog. Um, and then I've, on that, based on that website, I wrote a book that will tie into the website um, that pe parents could use with their children or teachers could use with their children to instill in a young person the importance of being connected. Um, my son uh, wrote a book for his high school class that's already been used by a couple of the schools over in Contra Costa County, and it was about um, instilling a virtue, having a child read a book and getting a virtue out of it. And his virtue was um, not being selfish. And so the character was completely unselfish and at the end ended up becoming king of the kingdom. So it was something that a kid could really buy into. So um, what makes my idea a little different is if you share your story of how you volunteered, somebody might pick up an idea. Um, there are so many ways of helping other people. If we think that our idea is the only one that's going to work in our lives, you get bogged down. Um, that, and that goes with the, all levels of volunteering. Sometimes volunteering, I've heard some of the best things that happen in senior centers is somebody just sits there and listens. That's a no sweat volunteering gig that isn't being done. Um, maybe it's walking a dog. Your neighbor may have broken their leg. Their poor dog is stuck in the house. Not only is the dog getting fat, but the neighbor's going to go nuts because that dog's going to be all over with too much energy. And so it's low hanging type fruit. Um, but then, when you're talking about youth, they are starving for things to write to get into college. It's really a hard thing because everybody gets grades. Everybody takes the test. What makes them different? And my hope was with this website where they were telling their stories that they could put in their password and pull up a sheet that says every volunteering opportunity they ever had. And then they could start watching patterns because then you could write something out of that. Um, and then talking um, to groups, getting them to be inspired to do something at, on a larger scale. Because an individual volunteering is one thing. A large group, um, we've worked with uh, rebuilding together. You haven't seen anything until you watch a house go from what to, huh, this is wonderful in one day. I mean, obviously it takes more than one day. You have to have planning, but the work is done in one day, and it's amazing. So um, on the website visions, I need, the, I need to have people feel like they're connected to their local communities. It doesn't do a community any good for them to go to this website and look at the national groups. Some people do want to do, heck, some people want to do international, teach English in Bangladesh, you know, but there's also a need for local thing, community. Um, and that's where some of the um, communities bridging together. If you had a place where they could put in their needs that could be searched and, you, and they were, the people who were searching it knew it was updated, knew it was manned, knew that if, some, if a need was no longer needed, it wouldn't be there anymore. Um, that to me kind of made sense. Um, a, another part of it was to do, award, do awards. Um, one of the, I had some ideas about how somebody could become a, member, a volunteer member and somebody could become a member uh, that they're supporting these opportunities. And some of the opportunities were that um, if it was a youth, they may be able to get an award at their school for doing X number of hours of recognition. Um, when I first tried to do this, I tried to give away money and the kids wouldn't do it. I, I, you know, my own kids wouldn't even write what their volunteerism. So I, I was missing something and I was, I was willing to give them savings bonds for college. So there was something back 15 years ago that I was missing and I think this class has helped me kind of find out some of the parts that I was missing. Um, speakers are needed. I 
have a hearing problem and my voice is not in my own control. So for me to be a speaker, unless I'm coming in on an ability thing where I can show them that no matter what happens, you can still do what you want to do, that's about all the inspiration I really can give. So people standing up, senior citizens standing up in front of um, the youth and saying, you know, I volunteered as, um, you know, my grandmother was telling me a story during World War II. They went to um, the Stance Club. Whenever the, whenever the sailors had come back from their services, they were there to make sure that these guys had companionship on the dance floor. They didn't, they didn't go past that. It was run by the Republicans. <laughs> but, um, but the fact that these guys came back and they weren't quite ready to see their own parentship because they had gone through some really bad stuff, it gave them a chance to process what's going through that, what was going through their mind at the time so that they could go on and in, you know, meet up with their parents. Um, and then books to me, um, I'm, my, my degree was in, is in English literature. Um, the biggest crime to me is when somebody destroys a book. Um, and I think the more we write, the more chance we have of making sure that mistakes that happened in the past don't happen in the future. We can't learn from history if history's rewritten on us. And the only way we can stop history from being rewritten on us is by writing it ourselves. Now, volunteering and membership visions, um, I, what I was hoping to do was get it so that um, if a school wanted to reward just their own students, there would, be a, there would be a tracking that could be entered. When a kid signed up, they could put a, co a school code in. And then that school would know exactly what these kids were doing if the kids wanted to. The kids don't have to, OK. Now, I guess where, where I'm at is um, I, whether or not you like my presentation, I hope you volunteer. And if you, if you don't, I hope you look around and see, you know, we have a lot of group of people in this classroom that could use your help. So if you don't volunteer right now, think about it. <laughs> yes. And since my presentation is one almost exclusively of a self-serving nature, uh, I'm going to pass out some uh, notepads that have my name and phone number and some of the things that I do on them. My uh, basic objective is to generate some more activity for my business. And my business is primarily interior trim work. Uh, I concentrate on um, remodeling of fireplaces and building cabinets, but I also do a lot of moldings and door replacements and things like that. And, uh, well, the economy has uh, done me wrong, as it has a lot of people. But uh, in an effort to uh, generate some more business, I find that I have to uh, try to expand the uh, marketing that I've not been doing, in fact, because I didn't need to. Uh, until uh, this last year, my marketing consisted of a box of business cards, and I couldn't keep up. But that's what I spent on marketing. Just didn't seem to need anything else. But at this point, uh, I'm feeling as though I have to uh, advertise at some of the uh, fireplace outlets and uh, uh, molding stores and places that sell doors and windows and that sort of thing. And also to uh, reach out to my existing customers. Uh, some of what you see here on the, on the slides is just, uh, there's about 50 of them there. And uh, my body of work in this area is six to 700. So I've been doing it for a while. Um, so at any rate, uh, with the advertising at the fireplace outlets and the molding uh, stores and things like that, I really can't determine um, what the cost of it's going to be, whether it's just a matter of printing up flyers and asking them to let me tack them up on their bulletin boards, or, uh, 
what it is that they're going to want, whether they want uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, a payout on it. Sometimes they do. And uh, as far as measuring uh, what, the, what its success is, I, I can only do that by essentially feedback. And I also uh, chose an arbitrary increase of two customers per month in order to try and measure it in some legitimate way. Uh, the time to be spent on that, uh, I'm estimating to be two days a week which uh, will help me out if I get jobs. I won't have to uh, devote uh, uh, all my time, essentially, to finding more of them. And it looked like to be a good balance as far as uh, uh, work time and marketing time. Uh, in the, the area of the business itself, um, there are probably a couple of things that I can do to make the business uh, more sustainable and more environmentally friendly. Um, one of the things that I plan on doing is to investigate the uh, uh, Forest Stewardship Council for their uh, materials uh, from a practical standpoint, because uh, I don't know if you folks would be at all familiar with that stewardship, but what they do is uh, they manage forests, and they're not just softwood forests for framing of buildings and things like that. They also manage hardwoods, which is what I use in my work. I rarely use a softwood in anything that I build here. And by the way, the uh, the tile work's also part of it. Um, but uh, in any event, um, uh, what I need to do is do a lot of uh, research in that area to find out if indeed it's practical for me to use the uh, Forest Stewardship Council approved materials uh, because they do have an additional cost involved in them. Uh, primarily, uh, uh, they come mostly from back east, which adds a significant amount of freight and also affects carbon, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in addition to that, uh, they have a chain of custody for these materials. It's, it's almost like criminal evidence. The material has to be supervised. It's kept in certain uh, areas where it's uh, secure uh, from the time that it's cut in the forest the time it goes to a mill to the time it goes to a yard till the time it goes to a customer. And this has to be maintained. Uh, otherwise, you don't have a material that qualifies. Um, so I ha all that has to be researched. In addition to that, uh, I also have to do a lot of research through the EPA for uh, the standards in VOC compliance. VOC compliance being uh, volatile organic compounds that are present in a lot of the glues and uh, finishing materials that are used in woodworking uh, and wood manufacturing for that matter. Um, and I guess that, uh, and this was just pure guess right out of a clear blue sky, um, that it was going to take me 20 or 30 hours to do all of the research to get myself to a certain point of knowledge with it and then maintain it on uh, a very short time frame after that. And uh, as far as the measure of success in that would be the ability to quickly acquire the useful information and be able to apply it to the different finishes and the different glues and things like that. Because uh, although I have my own shop and I'm the only one that works in it, uh, it still vents out to the outside. So I'm not the only one that gets to breathe these things. And uh, that's basically what I am planning on doing. And if anybody has any suggestions for me, I'll take it. <laughs> I've got one. Sure. Um, expand your web presence as much as you possibly can. People ah. are really I would have to create one. Well, it's not too difficult 
to create. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Search for pictures there. So. Yeah. yeah. So you've got the pictures. All you have to do is figure out how to get it out there. If you can get some Yelp referrals and and mm -hmm. a number of other marketing, that's how mostly my most of my clients who are new to me, not through friends or associates come to me off of the internet having seen my website from more than one direction. Several of us in the community partly, partly around the community garden, which Marilyn and I have been involved in for since 2004 or five, um, have done a lot of reading and oh, I'm supposed to stand still. Aren't I? have done a lot of reading and studying about what's happening to the environment we live in. So we're pretty well informed having studied these issues for many years. And I think it's safe to say that we are not among those who say there's no problem. Um, I personally am convinced that we have a kind of convergence of problems that any one of which would be challenging but together are going to be potentially catastrophic. So one of the things that I have been motivated to do and some of my friends around me have also been motivated to do is to take some of these wonderful videos that are available now and show them to people in Venetia. So this is a project to plan, starting next year, the presentation of six videos that we got together and selected to the public, uh, one every month from January through June. We have had several meetings and we have selected a group of half a dozen, six or eight of us, and we have selected six videos that we think would be suitable for this type of a presentation. And we have the time frame you see there um, tentatively set out. Can we go to the next page? So our vision is that this can be helpful to people in understanding the world they live in and deciding on what they want to, to do about these problems that are looming over us. So strengths, we've got a, a group that's well informed and highly motivated. <coughs> uh, we don't have a good projector, which is an issue if you're going to try to show films because I'm a a retired engineer and I've spent a lot of time in my career, my previous life, being very fussy about how I present materials so that they are clear to people. My father had a saying when my <coughs> sister and I were growing up that the challenge is not to write something that's, that people can understand. The challenge is to write something that people cannot misunderstand. So I've lived with that all my life and I'm fussy, so I want a good projector. So we have to settle that. Um, the opportunities that are here, there certainly is some community interest. Um, I've been amazed at the people I meet across the fence down at Avant Garden. Uh, when we go down there to work, don't plan on working <laughs> full time. Um, in a two hour, Two hours down there, we may chat across the fence with half a dozen people. And I've been really interested in how many of the people are from out of town. I was surprised. In any case, um, uh, so there is interest. We have a wonderful variety of, of educational resources. There are lots of books, but in this case, we're trying to focus on videos. Um, Certainly there are many people in the community who think this is all a big hoax. So that's not a plus for us uh, trying to spread the word. But our goal, of course, is to present information that may make them have a, uh, encourage them to have another look at uh, 
the information that's out there. Uh, now I did the, the grid, um, it's on the next page down there, and basically um, I have found this process extremely helpful. Uh, I'm not, I haven't in the past been this well organized. In <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've gone through the details and this is a list of the kind of topics that we think are, are relevant here, you know, photosynthesis, water shortage, soil erosion, extreme weather events, climate change, fuel and fertilizer, fertilizer shortages, the so-called green revolution, which has been devastating soils around the world. World population is going up at a shocking rate. And that has ramifications. Seed patents are, there are big agribusiness companies that have patented seeds, patented life forms. And they're suing people if they, if the pollen blows across their line. So, I mean, there are some injustices here, I think, that need to be straightened out. So, we're hoping to stimulate people to help straighten out some of these problems. Um, and thank you very much for this group. I've really enjoyed being here, and it's been an education. Um, appreciate it, all of you. Well, I'm Raylan Fiscalini. I'm a local architect and on the Sustainability Commission, and I've worked in town. I've had my own practice for 21 years now. And I've primarily been a sole proprietor, but uh, over the past year or so, I'm looking into working with a friend of mine from Cal Poly. Um, we met almost 30 years ago, uh, <laughs> volunteering for historic preservation, the original inventory for San Luis Obispo for their effort to establish historic districts. So anyway, and David had jotted down a few notes I wanted to uh, state up here. The first phase of any sustainability effort within the built environment should be strengthening historic preservation. So I think that's a good start for this little chat here. So what I'm interested in promoting with this particular action plan is what I'm calling a sustainability pod and which is going to be a high efficiency, high energy efficient um, urban retro infill prototype. Now that's a lot of jargon, but uh, let's see if I can define it a little better. So let's see if this works. Okay, so I'm calling it a MyPod, a, po a sustainability pod, which is basically um, is going to be about creating a comprehensive model of sustainability building practices Suitable, suitable for plugging into an existing downtown. A lot of space, and this could be applicable to Benicia, but also many other historic downtowns in California, uh, for example, which um, uh, have need for uh, seismic upgrading and um, desperate need for retrofitting and uh, let's see, and bringing energy efficiency, sustainability, materials improvements to a site. This would be an opportunity to take one piece of property and upgrade it in doing everything we can to respect the historic resources of the site to, um, and make it very efficient. So, and also bringing good design to the sustainability revolution. A lot of the attempts at sustainability are very piecemeal and very engineering oriented. We don't want to forget about the human component and how it fits into a community and that streetscape and um, how it contributes to that. And so the mission is to change the world one pot at a time. And so the vision, I'm not going to read all of these as I just reiterated, or I just stated some of them, but taking um, retro infill. David, and I would like to introduce David, by the way, here. He's right here, David Subak of William D.S. Studios in Santa Cruz. He's also been on the Historic Preservation Commission in Santa Cruz for, what, a dozen years now, something like that. Could you define retro infill in your words? I'm putting you on the spot now. Well, the 
the sort of model we're talking about is uh, in smaller communities, historic downtowns that were essentially vacated to the suburbs and the strip malls. There are a lot of uh, one story or low rise historic buildings that are either vacant or grossly underutilized, often in need of significant repair and upgrade. And they don't really contribute to the ambiance of what used to be a thriving, small scale downtown <coughs> area. So those are the buildings we're targeting. So that, that's where the idea of the sort of retro infill, the building is already there. So we're not really starting with an empty lot. But there is a, a sense of retrofitting in addition to uh, one of the key components we think to revitalizing older downtowns is to add high efficiency housing, bring people to the downtown. That's right. Yes, that's listed down here as well. So it's seismic retrofitting, um, high, high energy efficiency, um, bringing multi-use occupancy in reg residential units, like an upper, adding an upper level, even if it's set back from the street so you're not disturbing the historic uh, character of the original building. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? And also, but a big component in this, and reiterating what I've heard from a few others this evening, is the economy has just devastated construction, design, engineering professions across the board. So I, it seems like a huge component in um, realizing some of these uh, projects is just making sure there's a financial feasibility study and that these projects are going to fly because there's such stagnation in financing right now. And so this is what we're talking about doing as a part of the package is looking at financial feasibility study and also understanding all the financial incentives, rebates, tax uh, benefits that are available because of uh, the down economy. Okay, I'm stretching my time out here. And just a quick run through strengths and weaknesses. Um, David and I, this, this is sort of a two-prong attack as an action plan. Is One, we've both been individuals working on our own for 20 plus years independently, is bringing our skill set together. And we've got a wide spectrum of skills. Um, green building, I'm a lead AP, David's a build it green certified individual with a vast amount of materials. Um, knowledge and and uh, code research abilities and um, we have a lot of contacts in so many different um, aspects of our communities I had never had to to market my skills ever before after 20 some one years to, to echo what Jim said but things are different <coughs> now and uh, another strength is we are both always learning we're big uh, advocates of PG&E energy classes at the P PEC Pacific Energy Center in San Francisco and throughout the Bay Area. All right, let's see, weaknesses. Um, you know, being individual, we have to bring it together and brand ourselves. We're old school types, you know. <laughs> we need to come up with um, uh, a unified identity. And we're competing with a lot of single discipline contractors and professionals. A lot of these energy upgrade uh, uh, efforts are trying to get the homeowners, for example, in direct contact with engineers, or not necessarily engineers, but contractors. And design is sort of left out of the equation, which is tragic. So anyway, uh, also startup capital in a down economy and um, David <laughs> And I, we were confessing on video, we both still draw by hand. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I, I do have a 3D program too, but there are a lot of um, new technologies available. And um, we're working on it. But, you know, and I will say David's drawings are the most beautiful you'll ever see. So why, why change? All right, so our opportunities, um, we have an expansive contract contact base, um, a lot of opportunities with rebates and incentives right now. Um, with social marketing, green marketing, and all the internet exposure, a lot of the things we've learned in class were very helpful in understanding, you know, it's doable. And so we're looking forward to that. Um, 
and just looking at some other types of financing, innovation, community investing. In fact, I saw an interesting article in the New York Times yesterday with regard to uh, communities putting together financing packages or creating their own department store. You know, communities, you know, not getting the, the um, support they need from institutions are putting things in their own hands. So that would be one way of doing it with this, a project like this. And revisiting redevelopment in Benicia. I'm not sure what the history is on that. I'm sure Gina would have some information on that. But anyway, redevelopment is often seen as a, a bad thing in some communities. All right, the threats, um, capital paralysis, the uncertainty of when rebates are available and the timelines, NIMBYism, of course, um, and the lack of imagination for alternative solutions. And so, let's see, from here, my, my action grid, I didn't really fill it out, but I just wanted to say, um, we're looking at two different, two distinctly different um, uh, efforts. One is combining our efforts to create a business together, focusing on sustainability and um, all of our expertise. And secondly, to put together a prototype structure that we could, price, shop around, talk to communities about, so we have something to offer in this um, area. So anyway, to sum it up, that's about it for now. <laughs> Go ahead, Marilyn. Marilyn, can you use Benicia as your prototype, uh, the city that um, allows you somehow to do uh, a project like that, Marilyn, downtown, to model it? Uh, it not to get you on the map with other communities? Can Oh, I would imagine so. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we'd be okay with this. Yes. Yes, Larry. I appreciate your statement about the importance of paying attention to design, and I hear in that the same thing I'm hearing in some of the the writings that I most respect that essentially are saying you need to visualize the future you want if you ex ever expect to get there. Well said. I concur. Yes. Some, yes, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I was reading a book on Steve Jobs. Have we all read a book on Steve Jobs lately or enough articles about his inspiration? I think I read something to the effect this last week that you don't want to sell your customers products you want to sell them the dream of a better future. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where good design can come into play as well. So that's it for now, unless anyone has any other? Mm -hmm. so, bike valet parking, why, why bikes? Um, well, a lot of people enjoy riding bikes. We used to ride bikes when we were kids, and that was our first mode of transportation. I and mean, a lot of, we wouldn't get to Sammy's house or down the road or get an ice cream if it wasn't for uh, learning how to ride a bike. So bikes have been a really important part of our uh, culture for some time. For some cultures, it's the only way to get around. Uh, it's, it's, there is no other motorized transportation. So it's an, it's an important uh, aspect of our transportation grid. Uh, plus there's or the also, No, it's okay. It's it's it. That was just wasn't what I was expecting to see. But it is it was supposed to be. Why bikes? Also, because uh, it's part of our, our climate action plan. Uh, we got a, a couple things uh, that are highlighted. A couple of the objectives: increase bicycle pedestrian mode share, uh, reduce reliance on conventional automobile travel. Uh, because of Benicia is the second you know uh, second largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, all of the cars that are around. So. It's part of our climate action plan, and that's why uh, the bikes are a good idea to get, get them out there and have those facilities. Unfortunately, there aren't really facilities. I mean, the, the Sustainability Commission has done a great job in getting uh, bike racks downtown, getting more opportunities out there. But for big events, when we have events downtown, uh, what do you do? I mean, can you tie it to a tree? You know, is it down there? Do you know it's going to be safe? You don't know what's going to happen. Um, so the idea, there's a, a lot of communities, and in fact, San Francisco is mandated for many of their uh, public uh, 
outings and performances that there has to be some sort of alternative transportation uh, facility. And so bike valet services are popping up San Francisco, Sacramento, Portland, Seattle, New York City. A lot of places are providing a safe, secure place that you could ride your bike and go and enjoy the event. Uh, and so this was uh, kind of my goal. I saw the need for it. There wasn't anything happening at the uh, Fine Arts uh, Handicraft Fair or any of the downtown to farmers markets. Uh, so we wanted, I came up with this Venetia Alternative Transportation Initiative uh, as the project that I wanted to put together for the bikes. And the project goals were increase the bicycle awareness, sharing the road. How do you get bicycle advocacy out there? How do you get more people aware that bicycles are, are part of the road? Get more bikes on the road. You know, we could talk all we want about how great bikes are, but until we get more bikes out there, more people riding them, people seeing them, and people comfortable with them, uh, it's, it's just still going to be a kind of a fringe element. We don't want a fringe element. We want them integrated as part of a, a real transportation solution. Uh, assisting in, in the climate action plan strategies and goals I showed before, uh, T3 and T8 specifically, uh, part of the goals that, that we want to do as part of that plan. Uh, and offer a turnkey project. My idea was also not just to provide a, a, a thing that I could do um, for the community, what I could provide, but how do I put together a package that doesn't rely on me, that I could hand over to another group and say, here, here it is, it's all set to go, these are the instructions, here are the forms, you can do it yourself, and, and this is all the, all the legwork's been done for you, and be able to get things up and running, because that's a lot of times what happens to these projects, we come up with these great ideas, but we kind of get bogged down in the details of how do you get, you know, what's the bike, best bike racks, how do you get these forms, what do you do about insurance, what if somebody breaks a reflector, you know, all these things, so all of these things needed to be uh, put together as part of the project and provide a safe and secure uh, parking for the local events. You know, the bike ballet, uh, in otherwise known as, uh, to my brother in Arizona, is Californians are so lazy they can't even park their own bikes. <laughs> so the strength, so the SWOT analysis, looking at the strengths, uh, contacts within the city, uh, as I put together the project, you know, I've been with the, the Chamber of Commerce for 10 years, I've been on the board of directors for six, so I've had a lot of contacts with, with city officials, uh, past and present, a lot of people uh, from Rotary, Kiwanis are part of the chamber, a lot of community people are part of the chamber, Main Street, uh, so I've got a lot of connections with, with people that, that could, could help out with this. Uh, putting the turnkey system together, in fact I've got all the equipment, everything's part of this project is, is done. Um, and bike valet project, it's free, so it's an incentive for people to come and use their bikes. A weakness is not many people are still using their bikes, and we we doing it, it's, uh, it's even though promotion is out there, it's still kind of tough. People, if you live in Southampton, you're going to ride your bike down to Main Street, well, it's all downhill, but going home, it's a little, it's a little tougher, so it's, it's, it's uh, a little bit more to get people out there on, out on, their, on their bikes. Uh, limited funds for exposure, again, this had to be something that, that was kind of a, a, a grassroots a bootstrap effort to how can we get this out there. And I'll talk about, uh, when I come to the chart, talk about how we overcame some of that. Opportunities, you know, these are, because it is a turnkey uh, system, uh, provide a way for the scouts to obtain merit badges, you know, the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and you do volunteer efforts. Um, this would be a way to be able to do that, reduce some of the pollution, uh, elevating the importance of bicycle transportation. I think we get lost a lot in that, but if, you, if you've never been able to, Constance joined us in a bicycle club on, on a ride from Benicia across the Benicia Bridge into Martinez, and, and it's such a great ride. You, you don't realize how, how kind of close it is to go from downtown to downtown, um, have uh, you know, breakfast there and have some coffee, and then ride back down and have lunch in downtown Benicia. There's a lot of opportunities for that bicycle transportation uh, for different communities to work together in their environmental sectors. Uh, the threats, not a whole lot, but in climate weather is probably the biggest threat. You know, it could rain and people don't ride their bikes generally when it rains. Uh, event promoters uh, may not like the idea, but I haven't run into that. Usually the event promoters are like, hey, you want to provide this for free? Here's a space, you know, go for it. Um, and theft and damage uh, to the bicycles, mismanagement, it's always uh, a problem with any uh, organization, being able to uh, mitigate the risk and make sure we manage that. Action plan, again, really small print. Uh, going through again, this was a project that started in, in August, so some of these dates uh, started out in August uh, when I went uh, forward with it. And putting it all together, I put together the, the expenses. I originally uh, budgeted, I think when I talked about this originally, it was $2,000. I figured oh, I could do this project for less than $2,000, so, you know, just kind of throwing it out there. 
Well, I put it out there, and what I did is like, well, how can I fund this? You know, can I get a grant? You know, can I uh, you know, write a proposal? How do you do it? Well, again, it went out to the business community, you know, being, having the connections out there. And I made a list of the 10 people, 10 businesses I thought might want to participate. I got to number three, and I already had enough money to cover all my expenses. Wow. All I did was ask. Wow. Three emails, I had over $700, all the stuff was bought, and it was done. Mm -hmm. So don't forget that when you're, when you're doing, even if it's a nonprofit group, don't forget the business community. They want to help. The perceptions, we talk about perceptions, you know, the high school kids, they're perceptions of the businesses. You know, just because it's a for-profit business doesn't mean they don't want to help. And because they have profit means that, well, they've got money to spend. So, <laughs> it, they, exactly, they've got money they, they can spend. It means that's, that's, where, that's why we, we have these, it's why Valero is able to contribute so much to the community because they have profits and allied waste and, and all these large companies and, and small companies too. Uh, everything from Benicia Plumbing to Allied Waste and, and uh, uh, Pacific Rim Recycling contributed to the project uh, to make it happen. And you know, within a week I had, everything was, was covered. Uh, banners, the things that I wasn't able to get for free, you know, or, or uh, borrow, tables and chairs, canopies. Um, again, I had to get some banners printed up, some signage done, uh, made some calls and say, hey, you know, can you, uh, what can you do? You know, this is a project that I'm putting together and, and ask. I mean, first things to do is they could say no, but fortunately they said, sure, we can help out and got half price on all the printing. Uh, vinyl banners and stuff, so it really made the, instead of a $2,000 project, it was only you know $700 project, uh, and it made it a lot more feasible. So the focus of, the, of my uh, project now is after we did a couple of events, I want to take it further. You know, I was always, already able to get all the equipment together, put together the project, do a couple of events so we know what's going on, know how it works. Now the focus is on how do we promote it more for 2012? How do we get it to uh, the farmer's market every week? How do we get it to all of the outdoor events in Benicia? And that's going to take uh, a lot of volunteers. Um, I was fortunate to get some great volunteers from the uh, Benicia Bicycle Club for the first two events we did. Um, but it's just unrealistic to think that same group of people is going to go every week to the uh, farmer's market and be able to provide uh, bike parking for people to, to come out uh, downtown. Uh, so the focus is now going out to talk with the clubs, uh, Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, Kiwanis, Rotary, see other groups that may have opportunities to say, yeah, we'll do it. Not only will we do it, but then they could also put out their donation. They could talk about their group uh, and have a way to engage with the community in a way that maybe wasn't there uh, before. You know, instead of having to say, well, how do I come up with, with a, a place, a booth at these events by myself? Well, here's a turnkey way. It's, it's, it's under the guise of, you know, bicycle valet, but it's an opportunity for people to get the exposure for their group to get out there. It's real quick. Here's just some, some pictures of, of the event we did at the Handicraft Fair in September and again uh, on the Arbor Day Festival uh, in October. Uh, so you can kind of see here some of the, the signage that we had. I had a designer friend did the design work for free. You know, all I do is ask, and he's like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll throw it together, and as long as you're not too demanding, they're, they're usually pretty uh, obtainable. Uh, so the next steps, like I said, is, is getting the community support behind it, getting more exposure out there. Um, the people that did come and bring their bikes, 90% of them were from out of town, believe it or not, even though uh, talking about it on Benicia Patch and on the Herald, uh, the people that came were like, hey, we didn't even know you were here, but great, here's, here's the bike. And, you know, we did it as a raffle. Uh, the Arbor Day, we, everybody who came in got a raffle ticket. We had Cytomax from the industrial park uh, donated a bunch of stuff. So we, and uh, uh, Wheels in Motion gave a gift certificate. So just, again, calling people and say, hey, we'd like to promote your business and provide, you know, free stuff. So it's a way to get everybody involved and, and make it happen. So that's what I'm looking for now is, is organizations that, that want to help out and want to say, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll man the booth for, uh, for a couple times during the farmer's market uh, or an event uh, that's coming up that's really important to them. So if you know of any groups and you know of anybody who's interested in, in uh, being helping out and sitting there and parking bikes for a couple hours, uh, let me know. Thanks. <laughs> So um, what I found is the company I was with before, I worked with public transit and working with the high school, um, it was actually pretty easy and I actually have found Benicia High School to be a little more challenging. Um, so what my project was is to work with the high school students and the faculty to increase the school's diversion rates, keeping things out of the landfill, 
and educate the students and help them with good habits so they can relay that to future students. Um, my time frame is eight months because I would like to get it done before they leave for, for the summer. And my mission to educate students and school staff on the merits of the three R's, recycle, reduce, reuse, and assist with a usable recycling plan. And what I found uh, was the challenges um, with our strengths and weaknesses. The strengths are, I like working with teens, I like working with kids. With a recycling coordinator position, I'm very educated in what you can keep out of the landfill, so I have a lot of information I can relay to them. Uh, my previous employer had similar characteristics, so I'm used to getting the teens involved. And I have some contacts here in the school district. Um, and there's a lot, a lot on the internet. So some great YouTube videos and things, resources that I could draw from. Weaknesses? Well, teens don't have good follow-up skills. <laughs> so one of the things I found is I'm working with the eco group there. And I would say, OK, well, I'm going to get back to you in about a week and see how you are. And about a week after that, when he'd finally email me back, um, then I'd find out that, oh, well, he hasn't gotten very far. So it's, that's kind of a hard part. And also, to get the students to take ownership, I can't micromanage either. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Um, one of the other challenges or the weaknesses was getting the maintenance crew to buy in on it because they're all short staffed. The schools don't have money. They only have so many custodians. The last thing a custodian wants to do is empty a bin from a classroom every night. So we had to work around that. Um, there's some good opportunities though. The eco students are helping. Um, they had some good ideas. I have a friend that's a well-respected teacher so she's helping spread the word. And she also got me in touch with the superintendent of schools. And um, there's also the state mandates that it's not just a, green warm, a warm, green, fuzzy thing to do. The state is requiring the schools to do this. So it, it needs to be done. Um, so I, and I kind of mentioned kind of the threats. Again, uh, I, sometimes I can't rely on the high schoolers and everyone's short-staffed and in a hurry. So my objective? Uh, create a successful recycling program and educate the students. Well, it's kind of two-part thing. What I wanted to do for educating this, the students was take them on a field trip. And I'm going to just pass this around. I got the opportunity to, through my job, I'll start here, um, to go to Keller Landfill and see how much we really throw away. I'm at the transfer station quite a bit and I watch what they dump on the floor there that just gets scooped up by the bulldozers down a chute and trek to the, to the Keller landfill. It's just amazing. Um, through the audits I do, I've come across where I'm helping someone figure out what recycling they can keep out of their trash and came across brand new briefcases because people have gotten laid off. So when they clear out their cubby, their glasses, their briefcases, books, all kinds of stuff just in the trash. Um, so I think if I took the kids on a field trip like that and they saw what goes to the landfill, the transfer station, and Pacific Rim where they recycle, I think that would make a big impact for them. Um, I'd like to take while they're doing that and actually videotape their experience too so that it, um, we can kind of get that as a, a file. And um, then I could also use that to help educate the teachers at their staff meetings so that they could see what the kids saw. Um, what I'd like to do is create an event, hopefully on Earth Day, and have them use those clips from the video and, and the interviews of their experience and keep that going, replaying during the lunch hour. And also the teens did come up with some games like, um, what things can you throw in the recycling? So you'd have to be on a timer, pick the right thing to throw into the recycling and see who could toss it in it. And there'd be prizes for that. So they came up with some great ideas. Um, so I'd like to do that for the education side of it. The other part is putting in a usable recycling plan. So I worked with the superintendent of schools and what we were having a hard time is, is if you, if I put bins in the classrooms like this, 
Oop, there's stuff in there. Uh, if I put bins in the classrooms like this, who's going to empty it? Well, okay, so if we get the kids to empty it or the teens to empty it um, in their, or their eco group to do it, then who's, are they going to go all the way across the school to a big bin? They don't have time. So we put, and this is a miniature, <laughs> we put rolly carts all over the school, and that way all the kids had to do is put it into this, the strategically located rolly cart. Okay, so now how are we going to get the rolly carts into the big container? They're too heavy. The maintenance crew is going to get hurt. They don't have two or three guys to lift it in there. So we ha I had to convince my crew at Allied that they'd have to service, for instance, 15 carts at the high school and have the truck do 15 lifts when otherwise they'd just pick up a big container. So it's, it's taking a little work. Um, we're getting there. Again, my goal is the eight months. I hope to have a nice uh, presentation at the high school for their Earth Day with some prizes in that for them and their games and the video. Um, I have had some experience with the kids working with videos in my former job, and I hope that we can continue to use that video to help the next generation of the kids there learn to recycle and especially after they see what we're throwing away. And I was going to put a video in on my old one from the other company, but let's get out of here. So thank you so much. Any questions?